to the uh, uh, to our workshop on systematic reviews. This is Dr. Tambu Devan. He is uh, the head of our Cochrane value, Cochrane CMC value affiliate. He's also head of the CEU and head of one of our medicine units. Thank you, sir, for agreeing to do this workshop. I over to you. Sir. Thank you. At the onset, I want to thank uh, Dr. Anil Kuruvela and Mintu. They asked us to run this workshop on systematic review methodology. Uh, that's something we love to do here in Velour. A brief introduction about us. Uh, our clinical epidemiology unit has been in existence almost for 25 to 30 years. It was started by Dr. A.M. Cherian, a professor of medicine. And we have a Cochrane division here, which is started by Professor Pratap Tarian, who we're going to meet a little bit later on today. Uh, it's a rich and long history. Cochrane South Asia was started in CMC Velo by Dr. Pratap Tarian. And we had members from many Southeast Asian countries. Now we have evolved. It's become Cochrane India. And there are Cochrane divisions in various other countries separate. And we are one of the affiliate centers of Cochrane. Uh, if you look at the website, this is the Cochrane website. And you can go and look at this website sometime when you wish to do that. Uh, it tells you all about this organization. Basically, an organization dedicated primarily to do what you came to learn today, systematic review. So this is a voluntary, non-governmental organization, which does people contribute their time free to make systematic reviews. So that's a little bit about a one second background about Cochrane. And I'll just show you some images. Uh, this is the image of the person it's named after, Archie Cochrane. He was a British uh, uh, doctor who worked in, during the World War. And he wrote an inspirational book about uh, how people are not collecting evidence on important topics and looking at it for quality and then making decisions based on the total evidence available for a, for a topic. So uh, I'm, I'm just telling you in, in, in a brief sentence. And uh, this person here, Ian Chalmers, uh, he uh, was inspired by Archie Cochrane and said, why not we start an organization where doctors from all over the world will contribute their time and do these kind of answers to important questions and collect it and put it in one place. So he sort of started this NGO called Cochrane. Uh, it was called, uh, it was initially just a loose grouping. Now it's become a sort of an incorporated uh, company. But uh, these are the two people responsible for beginning this uh, endeavor called uh, Cochrane. So a little bit about today. Uh, the next speaker will be Professor Satish Kumar. He's a pediatric rheumatologist and he's an expert in research methodology. His area of specialty is to teach randomized controlled trials and he has taught it many times. Thank you, Satish, for agreeing. Uh, he's a senior member of our CEU, Clinical Epidemiology Unit. And uh, he will start off with telling you all about randomized control studies. Um, the next speaker will be Dr. Pratap Tarian and he will be introduced separately. He will speak about what are systematic reviews and uh, what's what's the funda about a systematic review? So that's the the main bulk of learning what a systematic review. And you'll realize then why we started off with RCT and then we're going on to systematic review. After that, there's something like looking at the quality of the studies. It's called risk of bias. Uh, it's an important aspect of systematic reviews. I, I won't spoil the fun by telling you what the talk is about, but that will be by Professor Mohan Kamath. Uh, subsequent to that, our head of biostatistics will talk about the statistical aspects of this science of systematic review meta-analysis as Dr. Prasanna. For systematic review, one needs to search literature from all over the world and collect the information and then put it together. Our head of our biostatistics, Professor Azariah Javakumar, will come and take the next talk after that. And then you'll see me again at the end of the day. If any of you are interested in doing this topic, where do we start? How do we go about? How do we make a roadmap or a plan? A roadmap is called a protocol in Cochrane or in any systematic review. I'll take a brief session for you on how to plan a protocol. At the end of this day, you're not going to be a master of doing systematic review. Rather, you'll have a bird's eye view of this whole process. And if it's something you'd like to do a little more in detail, contact us. We plan to do detailed workshops. Or there are lots of online resources to teach yourself as well how to do this particular skill. So once again, I'm very uh, honored that Satish has accepted to our invitation. He's, uh, of course, our senior member of the CU. <coughs> He'll take an hour's talk on randomized control trials. Uh, listen carefully because this is sort of the nuts and bolts of a uh, systematic review of intervention. So ask as many questions. We'd like you to be as interactive as possible. So it's a workshop and all of you are sitting very formally. Please be as interactive as possible. Uh, some trains are running late, but in the interest of time, we'll get started. 
So thank you again for coming and uh, honoring us by coming from all over the uh, India to, for this workshop. So and thank you again to Mintu and Anil for asking us to this workshop. Just as a small one second note, uh, one of the founder members of our CEU was Dr. Atanu Kam Kumar Jana, who was is a senior neonatologist. Uh, and I remember that with CEU meetings, we used to go together with him and Dr. Anil and Dr. Wilson. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that we can do this for the neonatology group. I still remember Dr. Jana with a lot of love. He looked after many of our children as well. So I just wanted to put that interesting note. So I'll hand over to Dr. Satish to start off on randomized controls. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Satish. I'm from pediatrics and my area of specialty is pediatric rheumatology. I was so happy to come here because in 2002, I want to do neonatology. Okay, after finishing my MD, I joined the nursery here with Dr. Jana and Dr. Anil Kurula. But life is always not like what you like. Okay, so there is a time I have to come out of newborn due to various reasons. So I will always have envy about the newborn neonatology department. I heard that you all are doing DM, correct? Or DM residents? Okay, sure. So actually last two days, I had to change my topic because uh, I have taken this class for various people. But I thought because I'm going to take to newborn, I should not talk anything on rheumatology or anything on pediatrics. Okay. So uh, for the next 45 minutes, what I'm going to do is why I'm here. You are coming to learn Cochrane systematic review, but I am here to tell you about RCT. What is the link between Cochrane and RCT? Then when you should do RCT or why you should do RCT, different types of RCT because when you're going to put to a, a Cochrane review, you'll be collecting RCTs of different types to put together. We should know about that and how these results are analyzed because this is what you're going to do the meta-analysis. You're going to pull all the results of various RCTs and you're going to make a forest graph plot. And what are strengths and weakness of the thing? And uh, RCT is the one type of study design, the way we make progress against any disease. So now recently COVID came, how we progress. We have a lot of randomized control trials came. Initially, we thought hydroxychloroquine works better than they did the RCT. They said that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Okay. So all those questions will be answered. So, so Cochrane library, this is what Dr. Tambu said about these things. So what is the Cochrane library has? It's got a Cochrane review. It's called Cochrane database of systematic reviews. So when you look into the types of Cochrane reviews, which is available in the database, you have something on inter intervention reviews, which we are going to talk today. Diagnostic test reviews, prognosis reviews, disease uh, studies which are looked into the prognosis and some qualitative evidence also. So we have various types of reviews which will be available in the Cochrane database. So what most of the things, almost 70% of the things are going to be done intervention reviews. Safi effectiveness, safety of the treatment of the vaccine, safety of the device, preventative measures, procedures and policies. This is what you are going to have it in Cochrane review. Okay, so randomized control trial. So the Cochrane says, what is a randomized control trial? So whenever the, if the author state explained that the groups compared in the trial were established by random allocation. So any studies, if there is a randomization that is taken part of RCT. They also said there is something called controlled clinical trial. There is also two groups, but the two groups are not randomized. We'll come to that in detail. I'll show you examples for each and everything so that you will get an idea. Okay. So this is otherwise called quasi-randomized studies. It's not like a typical randomization you do, but you take two groups. Okay. You, for example, I'll tell you, uh, nephrology treats lupus nephrite. Suppose one unit in neontology in Velo treats different way. One unit in Kerala treats in different way. Can you combine both these two? Combine and see? Yeah. But that is not like a typical randomization. This is something called quasi-randomized studies. So you can randomize based on that. Two different centers, two different units when you go do that. Okay. For the same disease. Okay. So why do you do RCT? This is what we all know that already. So we have when you talk about the study design, we have something called experimental study and non-experimental observational studies. Cohort case control comes here. No design is your case report or case series. And these are the primary studies. Somebody has to put their work, time, knowledge to do these studies. Okay. Then secondary studies, which your Cochrane comes. 
So you all know that Cochrane is very fancy and all those things, but they don't do anything. Correct. They don't do any study. They just sit and criticize or appraise different things and make a protocol. So, but that comes there. Okay. So this is where the Cochrane comes here. Okay. So, and you can see that level of evidence goes high when you go up on the experimental uh, the <coughs> hierarchy evidence. So again, RCT is the one which establishes the causality. By this intervention, I am seeing this output or outcome. All the others says only associations. This is associated, smoking is associated with the lung cancer. Cohort study says that. How will you know only smoking unless you do the randomized control point? So like that. Okay. So before going to the randomized control trial, the overall of study design. So whenever you read a paper, they'll write like case control study, but it will be actually a cohort study. They may say it is a randomized control study, but it may not be randomized. It may be a cohort study into two different groups. You should know when will you know that. So to that, you ask only one question. Did the investigator assign the exposure? If the investigator says this patient should be given NG feeds, this patient should be given IV fluids, whatever the intervention do, do. The first question, does the investigator assign the exposure? If it yes, then it becomes an experimental study. If it's no, then it becomes an observational study. In the observational study, if you have a comparison group, it becomes an analytical study. If there is a no comparison group, that becomes a descriptive study. Suppose I want to follow all the newborn born in CMC who has got a single umbilical artery, for example. I want to follow them. So what type of study design? Observation. Descriptive study, there is no comparison group at all. Otherwise, I want to compare something with the people who born with a single umbilical artery, which is a heart disease is more compared to the people with normal uh, two umbilical arteries, then it will become an analytical study. Understand? So that's the important thing. So if we have a comparison group only, it will become an analytical study. That's why always when we go to research ethics board everywhere, unless you have this comparison, you will not make a reasonable uh, results out of it. You cannot control anything. Otherwise, I will just say, I have 50 patients with single umbilical artery out of that, 20 per had a renal anomaly, 10 had a real anomaly, we'll just say descriptive. So from the direction, cohort study, case control and cross-section, cohort means exposure to outcome, case control means outcome to exposure and cross-section both you do at the same time. So, but today's talk is going to be on this experimental study. So here, as the name says, it is an experiment. You are doing an experiment. So you are going to have two groups, which is the one, important things which makes the RCT very high, the magic of randomization, which you cannot do anything by whatever the methods you do in a case control or a cohort study, you cannot get a comparable group unless you do a randomization. So we have intervention group, we have a control group. Okay. So when will you do a RCT? We have a lot of, stop me if you have any doubts. Na? Whenever you just start. Now, whenever I want to do any therapy or intervention, I want to give, okay, so somebody newborn has gone with the RBS. I want to, one group, I want to give surfactant, one group, I want to give nasal c -pass. Which is better? Yes, it's an intervention. Okay, new drug versus a no, no drug or a new drug versus a placebo. You can compare these two. New versus standard of care. So what do you mean by, understand by standard of care? What do you mean by standard of care? Standard benchmark. Current recommendation. What do you benchmark? The current recommendation based on where the recommendation comes from. If you take all the American College of Rheumatology, for example, and they want to give the, all the cost reductions that may not be applicable to India. Because the American College says that I cannot use it that in India because our it, it, what do you mean standard of care? Do we have a standard of care for anything? Standard of minimum that has to be given. Suppose, for example, if I want to do any study in Rheumatoid arthritis. Methotrexate has to be there. Methotrexate is a standard of care. If you have standard of care, that has to be given because otherwise unethical to do the study. So any study in rheumatoid arthritis, I cannot do without methotrexate. Methotrexate has to be there. And you can give the other drug add-on. So like that, if there is a standard of care, you cannot do a study. Okay. Yesterday, day for yesterday, we have a uh, research ethics um, meeting for ICMR. Okay, so Delhi we have so from our side, myself and Tambu, there is a reviewer of proposals. So I got some 17 proposals. Well, one of the proposals was normal vaginal delivery mothers who has got a PROM, they want to try with PROM. They want to try one group to get 
injection augmenting one gram to that cefetroxide. So this is a proposal. They ask for some three crores of money for this proposal. All the they want to see, they want to see whether it pre prevents neonatal infection, sepsis, newborn sepsis, early onset newborn sepsis. Mother word PROA. That proposal was rejected by the committee. I, I thought I only reviewed this proposal. I thought, okay, very new thing. Because unnecessary, we admit in a nursery and give two days. Are you giving that still? Anybody who is born pre PROM, all the newborns come to nursery for two days, correct? Nursery are what? Are you still practicing that one? I thought this comes, okay, you give the mother one dose of augmenting before delivery, or you give two grams of cefetroxide. That proposal is rejected by the people sitting there. I was very upset. I, I gave grade A. That means this revision without revision, you should accept. They didn't accept at all. Then the person from ICMR told me, I was telling me, sir, there is already standard of care. What to be done for this type of mother? This study does not involve the standard of care, but the ICMR has set the standard of care for those babies. And they have told me the protocol also. Maybe it was a protocol. There's an antibiotic prophylaxis for the mother for the protocol so that you don't need to admit the newborn. It's new to me. They said this is already a standard protocol. Standard of treatment is there as advised by the ICMR. And this study does not include that arm. They can you have to include that arm, and then the extra you give this two and try. They rejected the proposal. So that is something called standard. If there is a standard of care to your community or your hospital, okay, you should give the standard. And you can try the new drug on top of that. Medical versus surgi surgical therapy. Yes, a lot of times. Okay, fracture. Do you put a POP or do a surgery? We can compare both of these. Which is best? Yes, we can do. Medical plus radiation versus surgery. Lot of oncology. We can do that. Complex intervention, behavioral interventions, lifestyle interventions, alternative medicines. I want to try allopathy with homeopathy. Yes, we can do RCT for all those things. So whenever you want to do the RCT, we need some thing called hypothesis. Okay, null hypothesis, alternate hypothesis. Null hypothesis says that whether I give drug A or drug B, both are equal. There is no difference in the outcome. That's called null hypothesis. I say null. And alternate hypothesis, I say that the intervention will have a meaningful effect. There is a difference between these two drugs, two ways of treatment, medical surgery. Then, so what you have to do when you do an experiment, you have to reject the null hypothesis saying that there is a difference. Are you accept alternate hypothesis? That's why you're doing the experiment. Either to reject the null hypothesis, which says there is both are similar, there's no difference, and alternate hypothesis. So this is the overall RCT. So you take a sample population, then you randomize them into intervention and control groups, and you do the assessment, you follow them, and again you do the assessment after the treatment is over, your study is over. Then you'd see the difference between the assessment. That's what's a typical randomized control trial. So steps in the RCT, Correct study design. Does this hypothesis needs a randomized controlled trial? Okay, do you, can you do it? So I'll tell you. Smoking, my hypothesis is smoking causes lung cancer. What type of study design I should decide do to prove this concept? Or my hypothesis. I feel my hypothesis is smoking causes lung cancer. What type of study design I have select? Case control cohort, cross-sectional, randomized control trial. Case control. Why? Why not go back? Case control is easy to do. I take 100 people who have got lung cancer and see how many of them smoke. Correct? Go back and see how many of them smoke. Cohort study. I just follow some 100 people. I don't know who smokes, who doesn't smoke for five years and see. That's your exposure to outcome. Can you do a randomized control trial? I take, okay, these five people start smoking from tomorrow. These five people no, should not smoke. Can I do? Ethically, it's correct. Yeah. Ethically, it is not correct. So, this is very important thing. So, what intervention you do? So, is it a correct study design? Pico statement. How many patients to study? Okay. Allocation, randomization then comes. Then, what will you do with the last to follow up? Blinding and masking, method of analysis, and finally, how to report it. So, these are the various steps we are going to talk today. Some concepts about each and everything. So, can we, uh, in this uh, case, which you have told, can we uh, consider the uh, post smoking separate and those who are not smoking separate and randomize this group and randomize that group? So, what is your exposure? We're going to randomize. What's your exposure or intervention? 
No, uh, with the smoking causes lung cancer. Yeah, okay, so what is intervention? I'll respect your thinking. With the smoking causes lung cancer. Smoking. So then, now we have to see. So how we are going to select the smoking people? Are you going to take 100 people in terms of smoke or how many people are smoking? Now, among those who are uh, who, who we know they are smoking, uh, and the other group, among those who, who we know they are not smoking, then uh, then will become quasi purposive. You are not randomizing. I am not yes. intervening. I am not telling you fellow smoke, you don't yes. smoke. Already that people are smoking. Yes. It's their own name. Okay. Sure. Okay. So, does a research question need an RCT? That's what the example I told you. Your research question does it need an RCT? Most of the time, the RCTs are done for intervention, for the drugs, for the treatment aspect, test, outcome, all those things we need those. Okay. If there is no other reason, if it is not ethically sound, don't do a randomized controlled trial. Okay. PICO, this is the standard things we write every time we write patients, population, or the problem. What are the important characteristics of patient health status? Then the intervention or exposure. C is your comparison group. What are the alternative benchmark or gold standards being considered, which you are comparing with? Outcome. Estimated likelihood of clinical outcome attributable to specific disease, condition, or injury. So, what is the outcome you are going to measure? So, we have to divide them into patient, intervention, comparator group, and the outcome. Patients, you have to select the patient. That's what very, very important here. You cannot put as patient sample as everything. Suppose if I want to do in SLE, it has got various manifestations, lupus nephritis, CMS lupus, like that. We have a lot of different things. So, for example, in your thing also, if you're going to do it in preterm, you have to include only preterm, don't include all the new parts. So, you should be very clearly defined what is who is the case. Severity, again, very, very important. Don't involve sick patients and the well patients in a randomized control trial. So, you should be uniform. Stage of the disease, suppose we are going to do some cancer, which particular stage? Age, gender, comorbidities, again, should be equal. And how they are recruited, where are they coming from? And social demographic. So, that these are the variables sometimes can influence the outcome. So, you should define everything before you start. If it is an intervention, dose, route, timing, frequency, duration. Surgery means what technique? Radiation means what dose? Complex intervention, you have to explain everything clear. So, when you write a protocol, we should be all should be very clear so that somebody read should be able to do the same thing. They should replicate in their place. We'll come to that at the end. Comparison, same thing. The comparison group also should you should talk about everything, what you are going to compare with. Outcome, primary outcome, secondary outcome. Anybody knows want to answer what is primary outcome? Yes, Merit. Merit was under a randomized control by to be my place in my unit last month. What is primary outcome? Don't answer. The objective will be looking over through, and the second will be something which is you've done the analysis and something else is for the positive. Yes, almost a little bit more clear. So, like, if you think, uh, MGSO4 looking for PDA to get the low or high IDH and all of that. So, that little more, little more clarity. What's primary outcome, secondary outcome? Primary objective, primary objective should be only one. the time. Should be defined. Second also should be defined. Welcome. Yes. Exactly. That's the only point we want to know. Primary objective is the one you should calculate the sample size for. Okay. That's the main idea of your study. Secondary outcomes may come positive, may not come positive. Okay. You should not project the secondary outcome as a big one because the primary has not come. Sometime back in pediatric rheumatology, they did a study on coronary artery aneurysms in Kawasaki disease. So, the disease is Kawasaki disease, the population is Kawasaki disease, the outcome is coronary artery aneurysm, the, the exposure is IVIG, that's a standard of care. Every child gets IVIG. Plus, they want to add steroids to one group, one group does not going to have steroids. And they want to see which group is going to have less coronary artery aneurysm at the follow-up. Understand? So, standard of care is IVIG. So, you cannot do any study in Kawasaki disease without IVIG. That's a standard of care. So they gave steroids one group, one group does not receive steroids. They follow. At the end of the follow, after six months, they didn't see any big difference. The coronary artery aneurysm percentage is same in both the groups. But what they found out was the people who received steroids, the fever came down very fast, the ESR CRP came down very fast, the time to the discharge was 
less compared to the people who does not receive steroids. So they said the study, they projected like that in the conclusion. If you give steroids, the chance of fever coming down is high, less chance of hospitalization, like less time of hospitalization, and your inflammatory parameters came down very fast. That's not the study. The, the, the sample size is not calculated to show that. Sample size is calculated to show the primary objective. So that's the primary objective. So you have to look into the primary objective for which sample size will be calculated. Second objective is may come positive, may not come positive. You don't need to worry about those things, but you should not bring it that big when you come to the conclusion. Okay, how many to do study? So this concept you all should understand. There is something called I want to show superiority, I want to show equivalence, I want to show non-inferiority. Superiority means I want to show if I give surfactant for a preterm baby who is born less than 36 weeks, the chance of RDS is 50% is reduced. Compared to the people, I give only nasal oxygen. Nasal oxygen also will reduce the RDS, correct? So that is 20%. If I give surfactant, 30%. I want to show 30% difference if I give surfactant over nasal oxygen. So that is I want to show superiority. Equivalence means whether you give this or that, 20% chance that uh, RDS will be prevented. Non-inferiority means that is 50%, this is 20%, correct? This is 30% difference I want to show. Suppose Nasal, uh, if I give this one, there's only 25% chance or like 15% chance for 20% chance for nasal oxygen, 15% chance for surfactant. This is not superior, but not like it doesn't work. So the margin. So I'll just show the example. Okay. So this is the margin, non inferiority margin you are keeping. So you have to set, as a clinician, we have to set. Don't go and ask the statistician what you want to show in your primary objective. I want to show whether the new treatment is equal to the old treatment or it is superior to the old treatment or it is non-inferior. Okay. okay. So I'll show you some examples. Why do you want to already one treatment is available? Why do you want to show one more study to show that both are equal? So existing effective treatment is already there. Placebo control trial is unethical. You cannot give placebo and use this new drug. Life-threatening illnesses. We cannot leave it without any drug. We cannot do a placebo control trial. So the newer treatment may have fewer side effects, greater convenience, lower cost, high quality of life, provide alternate second line therapy. For example, so this is a study. I just show you to show all the newborn studies which is published. So here, if you read a randomized open label equivalence trial, then when you read the topic itself, you should know what these fellows are trying to do. So what they're trying to do here is, this study is done in Congo, Kenya, Nigeria. Fast breathing, some newborn has come with fast breathing alone as a single sign of illness and possible serious bacterial infection. Parents did not accept the usual normal, this child should go to the referral center for IV antibodies, correct? Some newborn has not fast breathing. But what we are trying to do is, so their standard of care is to give injection, benzyl penicillin, procaine penicillin plus gentamicin, compare for treatment of nurse, young infant, fast breathing, and referral, compared to oral amoxicillin. Is it oral amoxicillin effective as? IV penicillin plus gentamicin. That's the study they did. Okay. So they said, so you have to see that the outcome is whether they become sick and they go for hospitalization. The primary analysis of protocol, as per protocol, use the similarity margin of 5%. So whether you use benzene penicillin or oral amoxicillin, there is 5% chance this child will become sick. So equivalence. I just want to show equivalence. What's the advantage? Or lamoxylin, no need for IV, no need for IM amoxylin. So whether they are able to show or not, so what they found out from the study is that's the equivalence they want to say. They, they set the limit of 5% that we have to do. Okay. So what they found out was both are equal. You can see here in the procaine benzene gentamicin group, 22% failed treatment comparative to the other group, 19%. So both are same. Why do you want to give injection? So this is something called equivalence, right? They want to show equivalence. The new treatment is equal to the existing treatment. Non-inferiority, I told you. The new treatment is not superior. It is not equal, but not very inferior. It's not, doesn't mean like that it doesn't work. It will work, whether it is good or bad. For example, lupus nephritis, in the olden day, cyclophosphate is a treatment of choice. Everybody gets cyclophosphate. Now, we don't use cyclophosphate. 
we use mycophenolate. What the study showed is mycophenolate is not superior to cyclophosphamide. It is non-inferior, but lot of advantages. Oral drug, no need for hospitalization, no need for secondary ovarian failure with cyclophosphamide, no pancytopenia, no hemorrhagic cystitis. So we started using mycophenolate. So non-inferior drug. So what they are trying to do in this trial is preterm delivery given half dose versus full dose of antenatal beta methadone multi center double blind placebo control non inferiority trial so what they are trying to do every mother who is going to be like three term delivery going to deliver they will give two dose of beta methadone correct so what they are trying to do is first dose is full dose second dose is half dose one group will get full dose one group will get half dose so then again you have to set the margin correct Okay, so here they set the margin. The non-inferiority would be shown if the higher limit of 95% confidence to the group, treatment group between the half dose and the full dose groups of primary endpoint was less than 4 percentage points. That you have to set as a primary PA should know. Does it, does it mean clinically significant or not? Does it make sense at the end of the day? Whether you get a positive result or not, they want to show 4 percent difference. And they couldn't show this in the study. You can show, see here in the intervention trial, the primary outcome occurred in 20% of neonates in the half dose group and 17 point. They want to show 4% difference, correct? But they couldn't be able to show only 2.4% difference was able to show. Then they finally said that even giving half dose doesn't work. You have to use the full dose only. So this is something called non inferiority trial. So non inferiority with 4% like this but it's like we will assume it or like many times. We assume. See, we have a hypothesis. But this is an experiment we are going to prove a hypothesis. Any cutoff is there to result 10% to choose all the stage? No. As a clinician, you have to decide. Does it make sense? The 4% do you think it makes sense, sir? Difference? No. It's a combination of land cell. Yeah, but 15%, 20% I've never seen in non inferiority trials. That's what I'm asking you. We have to calculate the previous trials and yes. take out a non inferiority margin. Yes, the margin we have to select. So, previously, how much it will be able to show the difference? Based on that, how much less I can accept, which will make some clinical relevance. That's also important. So, the margin you have to decide and fix it based on that. They have to calculate the sample size. I want to show. So, so when you come to the sample size calculation, you have to tell the statistician, I want to show 10% difference, I want to show 20% difference. That's the reason they put in the sample size calculation and give you the sample size. Because I put more of the margin to decrease the sample size also. See, whatever you want to do. Okay. At the end of the day, you should be very clear what you are doing. Okay. Check. So, uh, uh. These standards, so you are doing it against the standard, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So will that not be... Problem with the ethics like when you're not doing, you're not giving the standard of practice, the full dose. So, is, is it the standard of care is to give full dose? Then you cannot do the study. That's why the first dose was given full, second dose only. The second dose only they're trying to do. Correct. The first dose of beta is a full dose. The second dose, which we're going to give after 12 hours, they want to do it two, two ways and see. It is the standard. But even that it also is two doses. If you feel it's a standard of care, you cannot do the study at all. Okay. So, difficult to do any of the superiority or the theoretical Yes. So, last month, a few months ago, I went for IRB because we are going to be a part of an international trial. There is a children with arthritis. We want to give a new drug called Baricitinib, which is a jack kinase inhibitor. Okay. This is this drug is already proven in adults. Okay. Proven and uh, approved for adults. We want to do it for children. It's a multinational study all over the world. CMC and the AIMS, not AIMS, uh, CMC and uh, Ganga Hospital are the two Indian sites which will be recruiting patients for this study. So this study, so I went for the IRB. Okay. And this study has got a lot of side effects. A lot of people who are taking this, there is a coronary artery problem. And incidents can happen. That is some cholesterol goes high. So when the one of the reviewer asked me, doctor, you were telling me this drug has got a lot of side effects in adults. Do you want to give it in children? Do you want to give it in children? How will you justify that ethically? You are telling this drug is got side effects. You are telling me you are going to use for children. How to go about that? How to go about that? How to convince? I got convinced. I got proper permission to report the patients. Then you have a point at which you will stop if at all. This so one is monitoring. Second thing I told this drug will never come to India if I, my, this drug is going to be used for 
chronic patients who are not responding to the regular treatment, this drug is not will not come to India yet. So at least at trial time, my patients will get follow up therapy. There's a lot of oncology trials are done like that. Huh? There won't be any idea at all. The drug at least for the complicated patients. Like that, we have to convince them to do. Okay. Check. So randomization, very important thing. Why do you want to randomize? We want to get a two comparable groups. We don't want to have any selection bias. To which patient should give the drug, which patient should not give the drug. So this tends to produce the comparable groups. So only the treatment is going to be different, remaining all going to be same. So we can individual patients, we can randomize, we can randomize cluster randomization also. Cluster means examples, families, schools, towns, hospital, communities. Okay. So here is a study. Again, cluster randomization. If you read the word cluster randomization, we should know that. So what they try to do is effectiveness of system. Effectiveness of system for maintaining the high quality early essential newborn care, something called essential newborn care. So what they did was 15 district hospitals were randomly selected. 115 groups they selected, another 15 groups they are not going to do this early um, <coughs> newborn care and see whether that is going to be different. To show that early newborn, essential newborn care is very, very important. So this is something called cluster randomization. That's what I tell you. Okay, all in Kerala state, you can cluster say that one cluster is Kerala state, one cluster is Tamil Nadu state. Nursery is done here, nursery is done there. We can do intervention unless it is a stand up care. Remember that the stand up care has to be given for everybody. Okay, how is the randomization achieved? So, we have to generate the allocation sequence and you have to conceal the allocation sequence. These are the other two concepts we should know. Okay, concealment is very, very important. These are some papers from the Lancet has got a nice review articles on this done. Okay, simple randomization. Somebody had a fall, either medical treatment or surgical treatment. I put a dice. If it's six or whatever the number comes, I go for medical treatment. Whatever number comes, I go for surgical. Simple randomization. But what happens? It is not like I want to recruit. We, I, can, I will not get five, five people on medical, five people on surgical because it's just tossing a coin. Eight times I may get surgery, two times only I get medicine. There may be issues going to come. Okay. Something called block randomization. This you should understand because a lot of RCTs now they do block randomization. Block randomization is basically I want to recruit 20 patients, 10 in each arm, but my study is stopped at 10, half. Still, I have to get 5 plus 5. That is something called block randomization. For example, I want to get 100 new bonds, 15 one group, 15 other group. But the study has stopped at 40 itself. I couldn't recruit 100. But on the 40, I should have 20 of treatment A, 20 of treatment B. Correct. Then only I can analyze. Because randomization doesn't work like that. Every time you get one group, you go to this group, one will go to that group. First 50 may go into one group, the other 50 may go into, we don't know. So to that, for example, is this is the example. So we have 15 patients, A, B, C. We have three treatment arms. Okay. So three groups I am going to divide. So this is the blocks which will be generated by the computer. The first block is B, C, B. Second block will be A, C, A. Third block will be C, B, A. So when you look, even the, there is a two th things, the, the study is stopped at two blocks. You will get equal number of A, equal amount of B, equal amount of C. So this is called block randomization. Your computer will do this block. So can you guess? We, we can guess. Okay, this block, suppose B is coming. As a primary investigator, we are all blinded. So we don't know what is A, what is B, what is C. Okay. Stratified randomization. We can have to stratify because the drugs doesn't work in all the places, all the ways. It can work for different for different age groups. They will say that you stratify according to the birth weight. You can stratify according to the uh, gestation age. You can do all of those things. So that is something called stratified randomization. So that you will get enough number of patients in each arms. Okay, so this this study which I am talking about arthritis basically in India they want only five patients because they want some Asian patients also should be included in the study. They don't want more patients from India. They want only three patients from CMC, two from that. That's all they want. One from North India, few from South India. They already have the block. Even if I have fourth patient, I cannot put because that's all something called stratified randomization. Okay, sure. So to summarize, simple randomization, no restriction allocation. But remember, there is a problem can happen. Block randomization equal blocks. Stratified means characteristics are equally distributed. Enough equal amount of male, equal amount of female, all those things will be there. Allocation concealment. We should not know the person we are using, the primary investigator should not know the 
how this concealment of the allocation, which the patient, next patient comes, what will he get? I should not know. So that is something called allocation concealment. Because if I know somebody sick patient comes, I know next patient is going to be on the drug. So I'll say, okay, this patient will approve. My patient comes, I mean, if I know this patient, the A is going to be the treatment on. So that will cause. So that is something called allocation concealment. What do you do with the follow up? So we all assume 100% of the time everybody will follow. Randomized control trial doesn't work. The people may not get better, they will not go out of the study. Sometimes they'll go to a different place. The study may be there for three years, they may transfer. So we have a lot of follow ups. So, whatever they say in, in randomized control trial, up to 10% you can accept. Anything more than 10%, you should not accept. So the results will be get modified. So, what they do is whenever they calculate the sample size, they'll add this 10% extra. Suppose I want to have 100 patients. The study sample says I will recruit 110. So that even 10 percent that people goes away, I will still get 100. So that is something called follow up. Blinding, who is blinded? Is the investigator, patient, outcome assessor, pharmacist, who is blinded? The blinding is mainly to assessor bias. I'll show you. So single blinded, double blinded means participants and outcome assessors does not know. Triple blinded means everybody is blinded. The investigator is blinded, the study which we are involved. I don't know what the patient is getting. I know only A. They will tell you, give the bottle A, give the bottle B. That's what it will say. Patient also does not know. That's a joint assessor in my group. He will assess the joints. He also does not know what the patient is getting. Everybody is blind. So there is the blinding. There is something called double dummy technique. What does that mean is, suppose in asthma patients, I want to know oral salbutamol is better or tablet salbutamol, sorry, um, inhaler salbutamol is better. So can you do a randomized trial, blinding trial? Everybody knows I'm getting pop, you are getting tablet. We can do that. There is something called double dummy method. That means everybody will take one tablet and one pop. One will be a placebo, one will be a drug. So that is something called double dummy method. So there is a study here, okay, from newborn neonatal abstinence syndrome. So what they are trying to do is they are going to give sublingual buffenorphine or oral morphine. Well, everybody will get one sublingual setup and one tablet marking. So both. So that's what treatment A will be drug A. This will be placebo. Here will be placebo will be the tablet. Drug will be in the capsule. So this is something called double dummy method we should know. So this is what I was telling. So don't confuse randomization and blinding. Randomization before and is concealment of luggage is for selection bias. Blinding is mainly for the performance bias. Whenever you do a randomized controlled trial. There's something called effectiveness and efficacy trials or something called efficacy trials and effectiveness trials or something called pragmatic trials. I'll tell you what does that mean. Efficacy means I have a, I have a, a thing saying that this drug will work better than the drug B. So I have the hypothesis. I may have placebo control and do double blind. Pragmatic trial means real life trials. Somebody was telling Kerala, they treat the newborn like this. I will treat the newborn like this. It's like a semi quasi randomized trial. It's but a real life trial. Like one unit will treat, like an example, lupus nephritis. Nephrologist will treat the cyclophosphate. Rheumatologist will treat it with the MMR. At the end of the day, five years data. They will see their data is better, our data is better. Is it a randomized control trial? No. Semi randomized. Correct? One group is giving that is their standard care, this is my standard care. But you are going to compare with the two different treatment arms. Okay. Okay. So, this is efficacy. Here they want to try the nebulized surfactant is better than the uh, nasal CPAP. They didn't find out. So, this is what they want to show the efficacy. The efficacy they couldn't prove. There is another one trial called pragmatic trial. So, whenever you see the word non randomized. That's why I told pragmatic trials are usually non-randomized trials or quasi-randomized. So here some others who saw the video and some others who did not see the video and see how the pain was reduced after the procedure. So that is a pragmatic trial. Okay. Sure. Parallel trial, crossover trial, factorial design trial. Three groups of trials are there. Parallel trial means only two arms. Arm A, arm B. Only two arms are there. So you get a sample, randomized treatment group, non-treatment group, and you do the outcome. This is a very commonest form. So here is a double-blind parallel group trial. So what they're trying to do is 
antenatal dexamethasone for late preterm birth does it prevent the complication of late preterm birth so they are given the definition of 36 to 30 here they give the definition 34 to 36 weeks they are going to give randomly to give 6 mg of intramuscular dexamethasone or identical placebo two groups one group will get dexa one group will get placebo and uh, they couldn't show any difference actually the antenatal dexamethasone did not result in the reduction of neonatal death, stillbirth, or neonatal death, or severe neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. So, this is parallel, that means only two groups. Crossover means initially one will be treatment, one will be controlled. After some time, the, the treatment will become the control, the control will become the treatment. So, this is something called crossover trial. So, what's the advantage of this crossover trial? Chronic and repeating conditions gain the power because each participant is their own control. Now you are a patient, then you will become a control. So, for example, here blinded randomized crossover trial, skin to skin care versus sucrose for preterm neonatal pain. So, for the first heel trick, they will give skin to skin care for one group, the other group will get sucrose. But after the next trick, they will use the same, they will just turn it opposite. This is something called crossover trial. Factorial design means there are more than two arms, three arms, four arms, five arms. Okay, COVID, you all remember that there is one trial, big trial that's going on. They have five arms, one group get azithromycin, one group get hydroxychloroquine, one group will get um, what is that called? Toxilisomab. Recovery trial. It's a huge trial called Recovery trial for COVID. They did multiple arms. So that is something called factorial design. So if you have anything more than two arms, it's called factorial design. So here is a trial which is published in Lancet again. Assessment of infant position and timing of stillet removal to improve the lumbar puncture success in newborn. Very interesting. So, how long you keep sitting position, how long you, you remove the slit early, you remove the slit late, either in the sitting position or in the lying down position. So, there are four different groups are here, randomly assigned to get sitting position with the early slit removal, sitting position with the late slit removal, lying position and early slit removal, lying position, late slit removal. So, four arms are there. So, this is something called factorial design. Can you do a randomized control trial with one patient? That's something called N of one five. One patient can I do a randomized? Yes, dermatology is very easy. You know, you have suppose you have psoriasis or some fungal lesion. I apply one pin here, we apply one pin, and you see which is getting better. Can you do the meet one? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can do that. So this is again from our case. This is individual care of bronchopulmonary dysplasia patients. N of one series trials comparing the transpyloric and gastric feeds. So four days you give transpyloric feed. Four days you do gastric feeding and see the weight gain or absorption is which is better and which group. Same patient, randomized control trial. One patient. So it's something called N of one trials. Okay. Mega trials means large sample size. So here you can see there are some 4,500 big study. Huge sample size is something called mega trial. Okay. So these are the bias which can happen in randomized control trial. Selection bias. If you do a proper randomization, selection bias will not happen. Blinding is performance bias. Detection bias, again, blinding the accessors. Attrition bias, binding the participants. Attrition, intention to treat analysis. We'll come to that. Attrition means patient leaving from the study. How do you prevent that? And what will you do if you have very less number of patients? Publication bias, always there is something called trial registration. Whenever you do a randomized control trial, you have to register with Indian registry. You have to register and say that I am already doing the trial. Okay, last part is the analysis. Very, very important thing is analysis is we do something called intention to treat analysis or per protocol analysis. I'll come into that. What will you do with the missing work, missing data? I don't have miss, I have missing data. We can do something called single imputation or multiple imputation. Single imputation means last observation carried forward. Patients are on last in how was it? You put the same result for the next two, three visits. Best observed results carried forward. Worst observation results carry forward. We can do all those things, but you have to mention that multiple imputations which computer will do. Okay, mixing all these three. These are something called imputation methods for missing values. Per protocol analysis means you include the patients who followed. Suppose there is a treatment, it's a randomization, 100 patients should go to the treatment arm, 100 patients should go to the control arm. But given the treatment arm, only 80 were adherent and 20 were non adherent. So, what will you do with that 20? Will you continue there? So, if you do with only with the 80, it becomes per protocol. But if you include all the 100 which were randomized, that becomes the intention to treat analysis. Why do you want to do always intention to treat analysis? For example, I will show you. 
So here is there are two hundred patients with cardiovascular disease. There is two types of diet. One is a Mediterranean diet. One is a standard American diet, which will prevent the stroke. So we have randomized hundred here, hundred here. But here only twenty of twenty people are non-adherent. Only eighty are adherent. Then here, all the hundred are adherent to this. So the stroke here, the twenty people get stroke. Here, eight people get stroke. Okay. So non-adherent people outcome is also also stroke only. But if you do this relative risk reduction, if you do this, if you do per protocol analysis, actually there is no difference. If you do the per protocol analysis, the results will be always different. We'll say that the diet really works. It doesn't mean that. So always you should do. intention to treat analysis two things in a randomized control there is a p value and confidence interval how do you interpret the results p value and confidence interval p value means the probability the difference which we i see in the both the groups how many times it can happen by chance is it real or by chance in the real what we do in the epidemiology world is up to 5% we accept the difference what you really see the probability of the difference we see in this both the groups Up to five percent can be chance. That's why you keep p value less than point zero five. Anything goes beyond point zero five, there is something wrong. So there is something called p value. Okay, confidence interval means here it is not a single value. Here you see that the difference. Whatever I do, if I do a study in nursery in CMC, I found out this risk factor, and you do the same study in Kerala, there is also a risk factor. But the risk factor, whatever you see from me here and there. Should tell the same thing, but the difference may be the risk difference may be different. I may say twenty percent, you may say ten percent, but it cannot say that here is a risk factor, but there is a protective factor. So, for example, smoking causes lung cancer. That's my study here. Kerala, you should not say smoking protects you from lung cancer. That's why something called the confidence interval. I may not get the same value, but the value will lie between the two things. So that is something called confidence interval. Ninety percent chance of your population mean lies between the real mean is four point two seven. Those but can fall between two point nine two to five point six two. This is upper limit. This is a lower limit. But it cannot happen here and here and all. So that is something called confidence interval. Okay. There are other various things they will do. Something called Kaplan-Meier Cox proportional hazard. There are a lot of things they will do for the outcome measurement. Clinical significance and statistical significance you all should know. This is one thing, one study done in CMC casualty 2009. Okay, the people, children who are coming to casualty CMC casualty, which is better to give paracetamol or give paracetamol plus tablets? So one group will get only paracetamol, one group will get paracetamol plus tablets. They found out the study was very statistically significant. They said that if you use both tablets and paracetamol, is better than using paracetamol alone. But what they found out was the mean difference between the two groups was 0.4 degree Fahrenheit. That means if you come with 1 not 3, I'll make you 1 not 2.4. That's significant. That's really significant. The paper is published also. As a clinician, do you think 0.6 degree 1 not 4 will become 1 not 3.4? So we should always think whether it does make any sense. Okay, how was the sample size calculation? Is it really make a difference? Nowadays in dermatology we have something called ACR response. So the new drug something called biological system. Every time the company fellows will come and tell me, sir, use this drug, sir, it works beautifully, sir. Please use this drug, sir. They will show me some big graphs and all. They will show me, and I will see what is the response they are getting. Something called thirty percent response, or twenty percent response. That means if you have five joints, you will become four joints, and the one joint are different. But that's a standard which is accepted. The progress come to the market. They will say, sir, yes, you have twenty response. Sir, twenty response means if I have five joints, it will be in four joints. Clinical, I am not very happy. As a clinician, when I see the patient, they say fifty percent. Okay, sir, initially five joints, sir, now it's become like two joints, sir. I am happy. But somebody comes and tells me five joints will be in four joints. To use the toxic drug, costly drug, is it? Clinician should decide. When you read a randomized controlled trial. You see how much difference they want to show. How they calculated the sample size. Okay. 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 There are something called stopping rules. So the study can be stopped. Okay. So you do an randomized controlled trial, double blind. Nobody knows what's happening. The trial is going on. At the end of the day, at the end of the trial, you may get very good response. A lot of people have died in the treatment group. Both can happen. Either the treatment group people have got very good response, 
a lot of people would have died. So what will you do? So for that, we have something called, whenever you do a randomized control trial, we get something called Data Monitoring Committee or DSMB, Data Safety and Monitoring Board. You have to decide, okay, I'm going to do this randomized control for two years. At every three months, one third group of person, unknown person, will open the code and see. Two things can happen. One, a lot of people are getting good. That means you cannot continue study. You cannot give placebo to other people. The other thing is a lot of people are dying in that treatment. Then that is also wrong. Okay, for example, the same study which I showed you, antenatal dexamethasone for late preterm, multicentralized study I showed you, know, late preterm, I told you that it couldn't show any difference. This study was stopped. This trial was stopped due to lower than expected prevalence of primary outcomes and slow recruitment. They stopped the study. They saw that patients who are getting this antenatal dexamethasone are not getting enough response. So they stopped the study. So study can be stopped, but you have to Make again, you have to make some borders. When will you stop the study? So before you start the randomized control trial, you should know something else. Okay. Advantages always we know that advantages, biggest advantages, randomization, because that we have equal groups, we will say that cost will be this cost, this you will not come to know by that. Confounding factors, very, very important. Whatever in the cohort study and case control study, we cannot do the confounding here, it can be balanced. Randomization, I told you, allocation or selection, confronting bias, all can be later. What's the disadvantage? Highly selected groups. Okay, when I went for this study, this company came and called me. They want only three patients from CMC. I said, I have 1,000 JA patients. Three patients, very easy for me. Very good. I'm very happy. Three patients, they have 1,000 patients, they want only three. I, but I couldn't get three. I got only one patient for the one year. Because they have a lot of exclusion criteria. The patient should come every 15 days. Who will come? They are coming from West Bengal or Kerala. Who will come? Only I have patients from Gudiya come or local patients. So it's very highly selected group and the volunteers may differ from population of interest. So generalicity is not suitable for rare outcomes. Rare outcomes, you should always go for a case control study. Not suitable for occurring long-term follow-up. Adherence and withdrawal issues, as I said, they may go out. They may not get better. Limitations of external validity. Same thing cannot be replicated there. Complex, expensive, ethically questionable. I told you. So to summarize, gold standard of research design, randomly allocation, standard statistical, good internal validity, but you cannot use it because complicated patients, complex patients cannot be run there in a randomized method. Pregnant women cannot be there. Very difficult to get a permission to get to do a study. And if somebody is sick, you cannot do a randomized control trial. Only mild to moderate. If somebody has got renal failure, you cannot do So they have a lot of other issues. Okay, so Cochrane systematic review, whatever I told to get one patient, how difficult to do a randomized control trial, correct? Right? But Cochrane is not like that. Cochrane is like this. Nah, this is my data, your data, Usha's data, Joe's data. And then at the end of the day, you get a good paper. I will stop it here.